Hi, I'm Jeb Butler of the Butler Law Firm. This is Matt Kahn, another attorney with our firm. I will talk today about a car accident case that uh, Matt and I recently took to trial and were successful on um, just a couple weeks ago. Tell us about the case. Sure. So this was a, a car accident that happened in Metro Atlanta right behind us. We have a Google Maps street view of uh, where the accident happened. Our client was stopped at this uh, traffic light that you can see here. And, uh, the defendant was driving down Piedmont Road and, and rear-ended him. Um, now, what's, what sort of separates this case from any other car accident case is that the defendant claimed that his brakes failed. Um, the collision caused uh, some pretty serious injuries for our client. He had two uh, disc herniations in his neck and a disc bulge uh, in his lower back. And we'll get into what all that means in a little more detail uh, in a second. Um, Another reason this case is a little bit unusual is that it went all the way to trial. Um, as Matt said, most of, as Matt sort of implied, I guess, most of the times when one car hits another, the person who, who does the striking um, will say, you know what, I messed up, I wasn't paying attention, I didn't hit the brakes in time, or whatever. That's not what happened here. This defendant said to the police there on Piedmont Avenue, uh, and again, for the next four years, repeated that his brakes had failed. Uh, there was just not any evidence of that. And I guess we can talk about that more when we talk about who testified at trial and what they had to say. But that created a dispute that, do that doesn't normally exist. And that's one reason this case didn't settle. Um, the parties couldn't agree on that. The defendant essentially would not accept responsibility for what he'd done. Another reason is that, yeah, for, for whatever reason, perhaps because it was Allstate, the insurance company wouldn't offer our client a reasonable amount of the case. You know, um, there are, I feel like, some places out there where if, if that happens to a client of a law firm, sometimes the personal injury firm will try to pressure them to settle low so they can settle and move on the next case. That's not what we do. That's not what we did. Um, it took us a while to get to court. But we went all the way through a jury trial and won it there. So we could collect um, everything that the jury was willing to give our client and everything they thought he was entitled to, which ended up working out well for us. Um, four years is an awfully long time. It doesn't usually take that long. Um, but part of the problem here was COVID. Uh, we were able to get on this court's first trial calendar in the sort of post-COVID shutdown. So. The state court of Cobb County, where this case pended like most trial courts in the state of Georgia, essentially shut down for many, many months because of the pandemic. And we were able to be uh, the first case tried when they reopened. So when we went into the state court of Cobb County to try this case, we were the first case that Judge Bowers had tried since the pre-pandemic days. So since like February of 2020. We were the first case to try, which we were actually pretty fortunate to be. Yeah, and the, the, the case was pretty uh, pretty streamlined. It was a two-day trial, and we really only had four witnesses. Uh, we began our case by calling the defendant on cross-examination, um, and then uh, I handled that, and Jeb uh, called the... Well, tell us why. Why do we call them on cross Sure, yeah, so the, the, the reason that we... Uh, typically, when you call a witness in your own case, you, it's your witness, and so you'd have to ask, it'd be a direct examination, and uh, you'd have to ask non-leading questions. Uh, but when you call a witness who's adverse to you, or a hostile witness, as, as we call it, uh, you can call, call them on cross-examination and ask leading questions, which was critical in our case, uh, because we were able to keep it really quick by just hitting the really important facts, that, that, and that's that the, the brakes were fine before the wreck, uh, the brakes were fine after the wreck. He, the defendant drove the car home, um, and, the, and then his dad drove the, the car without problems with the brakes also. Um, so yeah, so we called the, the defendant and his father and basically elicited the te that testimony. Then we got into our damages. Uh, we called our client, uh, who testified well, and then we, we called his uh, treating chiropractor live. Um, Dr. Michael Gelman from a Peachtree Wellness Center here in Atlanta. And, and Dr. Gelman uh, was a great witness. He was really eager to get in the courtroom to you know, help his client. 
um, and he used some really cool demonstratives uh, to, to explain the, the injuries in this case. Uh, Dr. Gelman used this uh, model of a spine. It was really cool because, you know, he, he bent the spine and explained how you know, the curvature of the spine typically exists and how it, a car accident could affect it, where, where it throws it forward and then slams it back and straightens the spine, which is actually part of the injury in this case, uh, which is called uh, the straightening of the lordosis. Typically, there's a, what's called the lordotic curve in the spine, but when it straightens after a car accident from whiplash injuries, uh, can make you more prone to injuries in the future. He also used the, uh, this, this model and another one that Jeb will show you in a second to illustrate what exactly a herniation is. Um, we had a cool, uh, 37. we had a cool um, medical illustration to show it, but you know, he, he was able to bend the, the spine and show that uh, the disc is pinched and, and bulges out and hits the nerve, which causes pain uh, and discomfort. Um, oh, Jeb, if you want to show yeah. uh, how you use this one. So this model is a little smaller, so I need to stand closer, but um, you can see what it demonstrates. It, it looks like the picture behind it and that each of these white things represents a vertebrae in the spine and then the red disc represents uh, the disc, which is supposed to be flexible like that. It allows the spine to uh, move and flex forward and back and people even to turn side to side like that. But when a herniation occurs, what happens is a piece of that disc bulges out like that. And the disc, it's the bulging disc or the herniated disc can press up against a nerve, here represented by this yellow piece, and squeeze the nerve between the herniated disc and uh, this part of the spine. And when a nerve gets squeezed or when a nerve gets pinched, you can imagine what that does. It's not complicated, it hurts. Um, and when it hurts, that's bad. It causes other bad results too. Like if your herniation, like Mr. Like our clients, is in the neck, then the it can pinch a nerve that runs down your arm. And one symptom of that you'll sometimes see is numbness and tingling mm -hmm. going down the arm because the nerve isn't able to transmit the neurological electrical impulses that's supposed to travel along it. Yeah. It was another really cool thing that uh, Dr. Gailman did was he brought in. Uh, these MRI films and so he explained how the injury is caused and, and what it actually does using the models and then we brought this actual film in from from our clients injuries uh, and you can see uh, right here we have healthy discs that you know leave plenty of space so I guess to give a little explanation here this dark gray line is is the spinal cord and the spinal cord is kept in a tube called the fecal sac, which you know, keeps the spine protected. And you can see these healthy discs right in the, in the top of the neck and the bottom of the neck going into the back. Then we have these two herniations that poke out and deform the fecal sac. Um, and that causes pain. And, and, and injuries like this really never go away. Uh, the pain can stop with treatment, with chiropractic treatment or physical therapy, but once the disc is herniated, it's always going to be there and it could flare up from a cough or a sneeze uh, or even, you know, bending over to pick up the paper in the morning, which is why this case was so important to try. Yeah. So uh, we meant to show you another picture. This is a picture of the um, defendant's car after the collision. And then obviously we're back here to where it occurred and then to the, to the herniation. Um, so we presented that evidence to the jury. Um, the, we, we gave closed arguments, I guess, around the sort of middle of the second day. Mm -hmm. And then I already hinted at this, but Matt, you do the honors. Did we win? Yeah, so we, we won. Um, and, and importantly, we beat uh, the, the pre-suit offer by four times. Um, and we beat the highest offer that was made during the lawsuit by, by two. Um, so our client was pretty happy by the end of the day. and It really illustrates the necessity of, of being willing to go to trial and, and see a case out all the way. Um, had we not tried this case, we wouldn't have been able to get uh, the result that our client needed and deserved. That's right. So a lot of times, if you, if you listen to the news, you hear about big verdicts, and there are people out there who just 
who understandably, I guess, don't know much about the process and want to say, oh, that's just a runaway jury, or oh, that's just a bunch of sympathetic jurors. It's 12 ordinary citizens from Cobb County, Georgia, from all walks of life who come and hear the case. Uh, and it is, there is a lot of evidence and a lot of work that leads up to it. So sometimes when you hear about a big verdict, you, it's like watching a duck swim across a pond. You say, the duck got over there, and now it's over there. It looks really simple, but underneath the water, there's a whole lot of work and paddling going on. Thanks.